October 1962. Leaders from across the world gather in Rome for a monumental meeting with His Holiness Pope John XXIII. It is the first of four summits that will come to be known as the Second Vatican Council. After months of tedious preparation and document drafting, cardinals, bishops, priests, and lay theologians are set to embark on a revolutionary journey to examine the very soul of the Catholic Church. Rising from the aftermath of two turbulent decades of war, and now facing the uncertain climate of the 60s, they turn their eyes to modern life and open their arms to the world. As Pope John XXIII would frequently come to say, it had become time to throw open the windows of the church and let the fresh air of the Spirit blow through. My understanding of the Vatican Council is kind of what Pope John uh, the Twenty-Third uh, said in in one of the I think it was the opening opening day of the Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council. He said, uh, "We're not changing. We're not teaching something new, but what we're striving to do is reach out to the contemporary man, just to to let them know what our faith is and reach people where they are." At the opening of the first session, there was a tangible excitement among the bishops, coupled with tension and speculation of just what the Second Vatican Council would be all about. Join us as we meet with historians and theologians, eyewitnesses and experts to investigate the meaning of Vatican II and uncover the event, which would become a definitive landmark in the history of the modern Catholic Church. The catacombs of San Callisto lay along the old Appian Way, just outside the walls of Rome. Centuries ago, the very first Christians came here, not just to bury their deceased brethren, but to worship together, celebrating a tradition instituted by Christ Himself, the Holy Mass. Some of the most striking examples of early Christian art can be found inside these labyrinthine tunnels, including the iconic Good Shepherd, and symbolic paintings of the Ictus and Cairo, Greek abbreviations for the name of Christ. They looked around their context of Greco-Roman art and they drew from the Greco-Roman world in order to speak to the Gentiles. Art, as Gregory the Great tells us, art is chiefly for the nations, it's chiefly for the Gentiles because these are the people who have been taught by Augustus and by Vespasian and by, by Trajan and by Hadrian to learn through pictures. The reason why they chose to make art is to proclaim the incarnation. So the word made flesh visible, tangible, what our eyes have seen, what our hands have touched, what our ears have heard, this complete sensory experience of God made knowable to us. The mass of the early Christians laid the foundation of what would develop into the liturgy that Catholics still celebrate today. But how did we arrive to this modern liturgy? And how did Vatican II, in effect, change how the faithful worship in Mass? To understand why and how, we have to go back to earlier ecumenical councils. Prior to the First Vatican Council, the previous ecumenical council was the Council of Trent, which had been over 300 years prior to that. So there wasn't a lot of experience for modern Catholicism with ecumenical councils. When you add to that the fact that the papacy had become more and more uh, powerful, at least in ecclesiastical terms, and one could make the case that Pope Pius XII, in terms of church authority, was one of the most powerful popes in the history of the church. And so the mindset for many people was, we don't really need ecumenical councils anymore. But Vatican II would come to usher in dramatic changes, particularly regarding liturgy. Nevertheless, these changes would remain congruent with the traditions of the first millennium. The ones that are most notable for all of us, as well as for the young people, are all the liturgical changes. Uh, and so to speak of uh, a Latin Mass, and now the Mass in the vernacular, 
to speak, as I said before, of this wide variety of scripture readings, to speak even of the placement of the altar, though certainly that is not the uh, be all and the end all. Uh, they have little sense of a altar which is uh, not facing, or the priest not facing them uh, across the altar, uh, and by contrast, the priest with his back to them. Though a number of the young people uh, you know, are interested in you know, what is called the celebration of the liturgy ad orientem. Uh, they do find, at least the few times that I've done that with undergrads, uh, they do find a heightened sense of mystery uh, in that. You might say the Second Vatican Council was uh, uh, one, the first attempt explicitly on behalf of the whole church at the new evangelization to uh, present the ancient uh, messages, the central a person of Christ, the Son of God and Redeemer, present that in a way that is attractive and understandable uh, to, the, uh, to the world around us. And of course, that's got to be done without uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Cardinal Archbishop Emile Leger writes a very important letter to the Holy Father. And he has a number of influential churchmen in Western Europe, people like Cardinal Koenig and Cardinal Sunens and Cardinal Dupfner, very influential and high re highly regarded bishops in Western Europe. He has them all sign this letter. And in this letter, which again he writes on September 11th, a month before the council opens, he warns the Holy Father that if the Holy Father doesn't intervene, the council is gonna fail. There's no plan, the leadership is stacked against any real reform and renewal. And, and soon after that, maybe a week or two after that, Cardinal Montini, who will become Pope Paul VI, also seeks a private audience with the Pope. And in that private audience, in a similar fashion, he warns the Pope that there are, there are disturbing signs that the council is not gonna accomplish what they believe the Holy Father wanted the council to accomplish. But Pope John XXIII, who had remained mostly silent on the topic of Vatican II since his original announcement, was about to turn things around. The opening day, the opening mass, celebrating the beginning of the council, he gives an address. And in that address, for the first time, he sort of lays his cards on the table. Pope John would candidly speak out with his sincere hopes for the Council, including a desire to heal divisions within the Church and to promote ecumenical relations. In gentle yet salient words, he would also address the bishops regarding a recent interview on Italian television, in which Cardinal Ottaviani had predicted that the Council would be one of condemnation. We sometimes have to listen, much to our regret, to voices close to us who, though great in zeal and love of the church, lack discretion. They are prophets of gloom who see only prevarication and ruin in the world around them. We feel we have to distance ourselves from these voices. So the Pope right at the beginning says, look, I know that there are influential leaders in our church who think that everything out in the world is horrible, and that we've got to condemn all of these errors, but I'm not convinced that's the case. I think that this is an opportune moment for the church to grow and to renew itself in exciting new ways. As the council convened, one of the first things that became apparent was an obstacle of communication. With bishops attending from all corners of the world, Latin would be employed as the official language of the council. However, not everyone held the same level of mastery. They're not seated at St. Peter's by region. It's not like all the bishops of New York are all seated together, the bishops of the Southwest United States, the bishops of Canada, the bishops of France are all seated together, no. They were seated in terms of seniority, in terms of when they were ordained to the episcopate, which means that you could have a bishop from Germany sitting next to a bishop from Africa, sitting next to a bishop from Saskatchewan, Canada. This unexpected seating arrangement led to new friendships. 
and would result in unique conversations between bishops from around the world. So the bishops are on a regular basis sitting next to bishops who ordinarily they would have never come in contact with, right? And so what are the, what's happening there? They're hearing perspectives and stories and insights and pastoral concerns that weren't part of their church's world, right? They're no longer just thinking about the Church of Brooklyn. They're now hearing about the Church of Mexico City. In the midst of various controversies, the topic of liturgy quickly seized the attention of the bishops during the first session of Vatican II. This was aided by the fact that Pope John XXIII's predecessor, Pius XII, had given significant support for liturgical renewal, particularly in his revisions of the liturgies of Holy Week. An Easter Vigil Mass was implemented, allowing Catholics to celebrate the feast the evening before and not just during Holy Saturday morning. In order to make the Eucharist more accessible, Pope Pius also had reduced fasting time to three hours before receiving communion. Perhaps most notable was Pius's encyclical on sacred liturgy, Mediator Dei, translated from Latin, referring to Christ, the mediator between God, the Father, and mankind. He gave also an encouragement to the liturgical movement that was going on in the church, where people were rediscovering the, um, the riches of, um, of the liturgy and what was being made available to, uh, to people were translations of the, of the liturgy, but also the opportunity to even to participate in the Latin, with Latin responses. And then um, uh, Pius XII wrote an encyclical on church, Mystici Corporis, on the church as the mystical body of Christ, which are then also marked a shift from that understanding of the church as a perfect society, as a, as a monarchy in a sense, you know, the Pope is king and then all the, all the, uh, everybody un, you know, underneath him. And then um, he wrote an encyclical on, on scripture study. The twofold aim of Vatican II was aggiornamento, an Italian word that means updating or coming up to speed, and ressourcement, which was a movement among theologians that Council Periti, or experts, brought to the bishops. This French word pointed the bishops back to the source of their faith, the deep theological roots of the previous ecumenical councils, the teachings of the early church fathers, and Christ himself. I think the liturgical movement that went on in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s in Europe and North America, I think that, that, that's an important stream that flows into the council's discussions on the nature of the church. The church is built up from the Eucharist, when the people of God come together and celebrate the mystery of Christ's life, death, and resurrection in the celebration of Mass, the church is formed, the church comes to be in that moment. Despite the struggles of refining draft documents, a number of objectives surrounding both ressourcement and aggiornamento started becoming more concrete during the first session of Vatican II. Through their conversations and meetings, the bishops realized how essential the involvement of the people of God was in the celebration of the liturgy. In order to foster a more full, active participation of the assembly, they turned their attention to ways in which they could recover the rich deposit of Catholic tradition for their era. One common goal was to simplify the celebration of the Mass so that there would be a clearer understanding of the Eucharist and therefore what is known as the Paschal Mystery of Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. The bishops saw a profound importance in inviting their congregations to participate with Christ in his sacrifice of the Eucharist. What does the priest offer? He offers Jesus Christ, the body and blood uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ to the Father, but the people join themselves to that offering. The Mass is, a, is this uh, experience of being drawn into uh, the offering of the Eucharist to the Father, the worship of the Son, which is eternal to the Father. And all other devotions and pious practices in the church are directed at the, at the liturgy, at the Eucharist. What you'll find after uh, the Tridentine Council is that we'll find Charles Borromeo explaining to us how to build churches, the reason why it's so important that we know how to build churches 
because we remember that in the structure of the church we are framing the Eucharist and so we are framing the, the living presence of, of God in the church. And once those ideas are in place, once the idea of focusing the attention on the, on the altar is in place, once the idea of how we're going to use light is in place, what a dome is going to mean in a church, how the church should be set apart, what it should look like from the outside, once those things are set, then it's easier for the decorators to be able to come in and understand, ah, well, I'm gonna make this picture here, and I'm gonna make this sculpture there. From the very start of Vatican II, liturgy was an integral part of the Council itself. The decision is made to celebrate daily Mass on a rotating basis. Now you have to understand that for the vast majority of, of the Roman Catholic bishops comfortable with the Latin rite, they had never celebrated the Mass in any other ritual tradition. This is the first time they sort of realized at a at an experiential level that our church is Catholicity is enriched by not just the Tridentine rite celebrated in Latin, but by the Melkite church and the Ethiopian church, right? Uh, and the Maronite church. And so the bishops experience firsthand the rich unity in diversity, which is the Catholic church. It was in this way that the bishops themselves were exposed firsthand to the differences in language and ritual of worship, which proved to be a major catalyst in discussing the awareness of the needs of liturgical reform. Remember, there are over 20 Eastern Catholic churches that have their own canonical tradition, their own theological heritage, their own liturgy which is oftentimes quite different from the Latin liturgy associated with what we sometimes call the Tridentine rite. Ressourcement had led the Vatican II bishops to recover the centrality of the Paschal mystery celebrated in the Eucharist for their faithful. But when it came time to discuss how to communicate this through the Mass, suddenly the differing opinions of many bishops came into play. We had on Sunday just the two readings usually a reading from an epistle and then the gospel, and it repeated itself each year. As a result of the council, we have this rich array of readings, a three-year cycle, with three readings at uh, each of the Sunday Masses. And so the Old Testament, which was rarely touched upon in our liturgy, uh, has now become such an integral part of our worship. As the first session of Vatican II commenced, something unexpected happened. The much beloved Pope John XXIII was diagnosed with stomach cancer, a condition that was kept hidden from the public eye. Pope John subsequently suffered from a number of hemorrhages over the course of the next eight months, but in good spirit did not let his illness prevent the work of the council. On June 3, 1963, the Holy Father spoke his final words. My time on earth is drawing to a close, but Christ lives on and continues his work in the church. Souls, souls, ut omnes unum sint, a Latin phrase found at the end of the Gospel of John, meaning that they all may be one. John the 23rd had finally succumbed to peritonitis from cancer and passed away. The council was immediately suspended and questions exchanged over what might happen next. The cardinals met to vote on who would become the next pope. Among high stakes and expectations for an effective continuation of the council, just over two weeks later, white smoke poured from the roof of the Sistine Chapel, signaling a decision. The bishop selected Cardinal Giovanni Battista Montini Archbishop of Milan to the throne of Peter, where he would take on a new name, which would become synonymous with the council, Pope Paul VI. So these two popes uh, are in some ways like bookends, different perhaps in style, uh, one being more reserved, Paul VI, uh, still very intelligent, uh, a very shrewd diplomat, and the other being um, a loving, gentle pastor who 
was able to embrace people of all different backgrounds, John XXIII. That autumn, Pope Paul would reconvene the council for a new second session, giving the bishops four major objectives, a better understanding of the Catholic Church, church reforms, advancing the unity of Christianity, and dialogue with the world. He was uh, someone who was very urbane, I think, in his habits, in his intellectual habits, widely read, um, a good listener, and someone who was able to shepherd the council through some of the more difficult debates that went on around issues like the Pope's own authority. Sacrosanctum Concilium, the document on liturgy that would come to be promulgated by Pope Paul by the end of the second session of the council, would make it clear for Catholics that Christ makes his sacrifice truly present in the liturgy of the Mass. Of course, the bishops present at the council were for the most part familiar with the Latin rite and were accustomed to celebrating Mass in the language, but they were also pastors who were concerned about the sacrament of the Eucharist being more comprehensible and fruitful for their people. Liturgy is something that has been uh, subject to reform at various times in the history of the Church. And prior to the Council, there was a, a liturgical movement in Europe and the United States that in some ways anticipated many of these changes. The liturgy, comprised of sacred scripture, tradition, sacrament, prayer, and song, was for Christians the primary practice of communing with God, and remains so today. I, for one, believe that the uh, liturgical reform is really at the beginning of the beginning. I, I think we have a long way to go before the liturgy is um, celebrated in a way that is both joyful and dignified and really engaging to all strata um, of the Catholic population. And yet so much, so much hinges, I, I, I think, for example, of uh, John Paul II's ability to preside at a very, uh, you know, almost a mystical liturgy with hundreds of thousands of people. So, so that so much depends, I think, on, on the gathering itself, you know, that, that if people are of the same mind, as it were, and if, they, if, there is, if there is a prayerful spirit, that the liturgy as we have it now can be as prayerful as anything that was true before, before Vatican II. One of the standout elements of Sacrosanctum Concilium considers another aspect of worship, sacred art. What you'll find in, um, in a Sacrosanctum Concilium is a discussion that is completely in line with the history of the church and art, going back to the Second, second Nicaea Council, the Second Council of Nicaea in 787, going to the Council of Trent when they dealt with the question of art in 1563. And so there is a tremendous continuity of the importance of art and in particular, the very highly elevated position of sacred art and in the question of sacred art, sacred art which serves as a framework for the liturgy and therefore the demand, the expectation of sacred art is that it must be beautiful. The liturgy needs to be and it is the, the main source of where people will encounter God, most particularly the, the Mass. And so whatever music uh, will help lead that is important. Now, the church has so much rich tradition, so I think uh, leaning more towards one way or the other is, is sometimes dangerous where we need to be open to uh, contemporary music, to cultural music, but also to maybe chant bass or, or Gregorian chant and, and other types of, of music uh, to understand that we are part of a tradition that goes back 2,000 years and the importance of knowing where we come from and where we're going. For the Vatican II bishops, liturgical reform was not just about the rite of the Mass, it affected all spheres of the sacramental rites, as well as the liturgy of the hours. In the Church of Santa Maria in Trastevere in Rome, members of the Catholic movement of Sant'Egidio gather for Vespers, or night prayer. Their prayer serves as a source of strength for their work, service to the poor. It is in this way that their worship through the liturgy leads them to action. So when you look at all of those events, 
Uh, when you look at the Pope's opening address, when you look at the way the bishops celebrated the liturgy and different rites and talked to bishops from throughout the world and learned from the best theologians, you begin to understand now how a council that looked like it was on the road for disaster would in fact become one of the most remarkable ecclesial events in the history of modern Roman Catholicism. Discussions about liturgy had heightened a pressing need to discuss the nature of the church itself. During the course of the second and third sessions, the bishops would turn their attention to this subject and develop a major dogmatic constitution, which would come to be known as Lumen Gentium. A Lumen Gentium Sidcum Christi. Christ is the light of, of the nations. Christ is the light of the world. How did Lumen Gentium become a watershed moment in the history of the Catholic Church? Find out next time on Vatican II, Inside the Council.